The Buffalo Bills show some resiliency as they take down the Lions 28-25 to on Thanksgiving. You are now listening to the Watering Buffalo Podcast with your hosts, Justin Goddard and Andrew Chang. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fan Base Podcast Network. My name is Justin. I'm going to be your host today. Um, and we are going to be talking about uh, the victory over the Detroit Lions on Thanksgiving. Uh, before we get started, this show is brought to you by 26 Shirts. Uh, we've been talking about them for a while now, so if you haven't done so already, Um, Go ahead and check out 26 Shirts. Um, Not only do they have awesome t-shirt designs, uh, they also do great work in the community. Um, So get yourself some awesome shirts while, you know, helping contribute to awesome causes. Um, So this Detroit game, man, was that one a bit too close for comfort for me. And I guess going, going into the game, this is about how I thought the end result would look um, didn't make it any easier (laughs) consuming the game. Um, But people are kind of sleeping on the Lions. You know, the Lions have been so sad for so long. And I think a lot of people aren't noticing the team that they're kind of becoming. It seems like they're, they're buying in with Dan Campbell and they still have their struggles on defense, but they've had a, a pretty potent offense this year, um, kind of going toe-to-toe in some shootout games with people and, you know, coming in hot on a three-game win streak. Uh, you know all the eyeballs are on this game. They're they're taking on, you know, Super Bowl favorite Buffalo Bills. You know you're getting the Lions' best shot, and boy, do they almost have it. Um, so... Diving into the game, I want to start off talking about Josh Allen and honestly, looking looking at the numbers stat wise, um, it looks like Josh had a pretty good game, and and I'm not here to say otherwise. Um, what I will say is Josh Allen to me still doesn't look like himself. Um, he doesn't look like the guy that we saw at the tail end of last year um, or even the beginning of this year. And I don't know if it's something mental going on, if there's, you know, that elbow is bothering him uh, more than they're really letting us know. Uh, maybe it's, you know, some of the new play calling. Uh, whatever the case is, I guess my my end point is that I'm pretty damn psyched that if this is our quarterback at, you know, 75%, uh, he's still going out there putting up over 300 yards, right? Uh, It makes me feel really good about when we do get him back fully healthy, when he gets there. Um, It gives me confidence that he's going to get back to that level that we are becoming so used to. Um, Because again, on his best, on not his best day, we're still talking 250 yards passing, another 80 yards rushing, um, still accounting for three touchdowns. Um, basically being, you know, about 85% of the offense again. And, you know, this is a guy that's, if you're just watching the game, you can tell he's just not quite at 100%. Um, we did have another red zone interception. Uh, those those are and will remain concerning um, that it's just points off the board every time, even if, you get in a situation where you have to settle for a field goal. You know, a field goal ends up being the difference in this game, and that's those are the turnovers that we really can't have. Those are the ones that are really difficult to make up for. Um, something that I haven't seen a ton of this year and something that I would love to um, be brought back into the playbook, especially in the red zone where we're having um, trouble throwing it in, in these small windows, we haven't seen very many of the design quarterback runs, the, the um, kind of like quarterback sweep, um, 
some of those like triple options where Josh starts running, the linemen stay in, and uh, Dawson Knox leaks out. I haven't seen a ton of that kind of creativity in the red zone. And to me, I, I'm, I'm always erring on the side of, you know, not wanting to get too cute um, in particular in the red zone. Um, but some of those like quarterback powers off to the, off to the left side, the bootlegs, they've worked so well and it's not, you know, some, some crazy cute play where you're putting the ball into somebody's hands that doesn't, you know, often get the ball. Um, something that I would like to see mixed in, but Hey, Dorsey, if you're listening, give me what I want, man. (laughs) Um, moving into the running backs, another good week for Devin Singletary. And I don't think this is a team that we're really going to see very many hundred yard games. And, you know, that's kind of like the standard of a good day for a running back in the NFL. You know, that that milestone mark of 100 yards. I think what Singletary did against the Lions is what a good game for a running back looks like in Buffalo. Um, 14 carries, 72 yards, um, just, you know, ripping off chunks here and there. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a team where you're going to get 100 yards very easily because we're not going to give you 20, 25 attempts. Um, And honestly, averaging something like six yards a carry and having 14 carries to get you up to that 72, I'm cool with that. Um, You know, some of these guys getting to 100 yards rushing, but they had 25 carries, you know, that's, that's still averaging four yards a carry like that. That's still good, but it's that many more plays and when your quarterback is Josh Allen, you know, averaging four yards is a little bit different than, you know, a 12-yard pass that he could have. Um, that being said, I, I've appreciated the emergence of the run game over the last couple games. Just to kind of have that balance um, and be able to, you know, keep defenses guessing enough that they're not just selling out on the pass um, every play. Uh, so... Singletary, overall very good day. Naheem Hines and James Cook, really, really nothing to talk about here. They both had very limited opportunities um, carrying the balls. They combined for three carries, and I think it was seven or eight yards. Um, So for a team that's, you know, really kind of not had the the quote-unquote workhorse running back, uh, it's kind of becoming Singletary, and we saw this a bit towards the end of last year as well. Um, now I know, you know, Heinz kind of just joined the team, and he's really contributing on special teams. Um, Cook still being a rookie, you know, when you're in a closer game like this, you go with the guy who you trust, and that's Singletary right now. Um, is something? It is something that's a bit of a concern to me as we get into this final stretch when we're looking at the playoffs uh I, I would like to have a second running back that we really feel like we can trust we know what we're getting out of them um because we're as it stands right now we're one Devin Singletary injury uh away from at this point what it, what is our run game without Singletary um so I think that is something that that we need to be mindful of and and kind of start looking for w- what that plan is if if Singletary goes down because we haven't seen a ton of work from any of these other guys. Uh, with Singletary's success, I'm I'm more impressed with Singletary's success in this game um, based on some of the offensive line struggles that we had. Um, we saw Allen get sacked three times. Um, different quarterback. That number's probably six seven. He was. He had people after him all day. Um, and, you know, not not horribly surprising. We did go into the game um, with Mitch Morse injured. A little bit of shuffling going around. Um, Deion Dawkins goes down during the game. Uh, Spencer Brown also left the game for, for a bit with an injury. Um, but t- to be honest, Brown was really struggling in, in that game before anything happened. Um, so... An offensive line that I feel has been playing, at least in pass protection, pretty well this year, um, really struggled. So it, it was kind of 
the opposite side of the coin for me in this game that they were able to seemingly run block a bit better um, while we were struggling pass protection. Um, so a couple key injuries there. Um, it looks like Mitch Morse is going to be back at practice. Um, we'll have to see what's going on with Deion Dawkins. Um, it, it looked like they kind of kept him out of the game more precautionary. Um, but we'll see what happens there. Hopefully, you know, having a full full week until the next game, um, be able to get these guys back in there and healthy. Uh, in, in the receiving game, we'll lump wide receivers and tight ends together. I, I have to say that I was kind of disappointed with the usage of Knox in this game and kind of on the season as a whole. Um, we see him have, you know, the, the go seven for seven and 70 yards uh, just a week ago. And in this game, he's only targeted twice, uh, catches both targets at, for 17 yards. Uh, it just seems to me like some of the we're struggling to get some contributions consistently from other wide receivers and just the mismatch that Knox can be and his physicality when he has the ball in his hands. It just seems like a guy that we should kind of be scheming up some more opportunities for, whether it's, you know, a tight end screen. Uh, We even saw last year, there was uh, like a jet sweep with Dawson Knox. Um, some like I mentioned earlier, some of those triple option RPOs in the red zone. It just seems like with his athleticism, this is a guy that we need to to get more looks, especially as we're dealing with you know some of the consistency at receiver outside of Stefan Diggs. Uh, speaking of Diggs, eight for fifteen for seventy seven yards and a touchdown in this game. Uh, McKenzie, the leader in the clubhouse, six catches, ten yard or. Six catches on 10 attempts, 96 yards, and a touchdown. And then Gabe Davis, four catches, five attempts uh, for 38 yards. Um, So this was a really good game for McKenzie. My problem with McKenzie in this offense is kind of the consistency that I was just talking about. And to me, he seems like he's very boomer bust um with his increased role this year um i honestly i'm looking for out of mckenzie something like five catches 50 yards on a week in week out basis you know something kind of minimal like that uh but it seems like with mckenzie we either get 100 yards and a touchdown or you know two catches on eight targets for like 15 yards there's there's kind of like no in between with him and I think that's kind of the spot that we're really missing in this offense. Um, Gabe Davis, he's kind of been up and down. Actually, kind of similar to that, just in a very different way. Um, But I feel like what this offense is really missing is that kind of consistent possession receiver, the like third and four to like third and eight range where they just kind of run an option route, sit down in a sweet spot in the zone and just move the chains. Um, we, we have all the other plays going on. We have the deep shot available. Um, we have the, the in-between stuff. It just seems like we're kind of struggling on third down. And, and that was a role that that was, that was Cole Beasley territory, um, third and Cole, right? Um, I think there's certain things that McKenzie can do better than Beasley can do, and I think he has limitations the other way. Um, this is a spot where, you know, maybe Jamison Crowder was supposed to be that player. You know, we didn't, he didn't really, he wasn't really filling that role when we saw him early in the season, um, but he also didn't get a ton of time for us to see him. Um, there is talk of, you know, possibly he is able to return this season. We'll see what happens there. Um, but I'm, I've been calling for it for a while. I, I really want to see Khalil Shakir get some run there. And I know under McDermott, it, it's a very big emphasis on everybody, you know, earning their time on the field, kind of paying their dues. And I don't know if we're seeing kind of a, a product of that. And that's why we haven't seen a ton from Shakir or, you know, if behind the scenes, he's not really popping in practice enough to 
um, justify inserting him. Um, but I, I do think that we need something outside of Stefan Diggs uh, week in and week out, some sort of spark there. And being that this game was on Thursday, I'm still recording on Sunday like we typically do. Uh, we did see yesterday the Bills do something, by the way, of improving that wide receiver room. And that was bringing back an old fan favorite in John Brown. And my my initial reaction to seeing this, like, I was hype. You know, we immediately go back to who John Brown was when he was last in Buffalo and playing healthy. And he put up some fantastic numbers with Josh Allen. Um, and now we are, you know, a year or two removed from that. Um, he hasn't played at all this season. He last played with the Bucks, I believe it was January of last year. Um, so as I, as I started thinking about this for a minute, you know, I'm, I'm immediately thinking about Brown stretching the field vertically, those tunnel screens that we used to do with him, um, and kind of having him stretch the field and open up underneath stuff for the other guys. I have to take a step back and remember that, you know, he's coming in, uh, week 13 of the season and, uh, I'm guessing that this was kind of more of the move we saw a couple of years ago um, where the Bills brought in uh, Kenny Stills, had him on the practice squad, and he was kind of like an insurance policy going into the playoffs, and we never really saw any action from him. Um, I think this is kind of a, a move that is is there in case that we do suffer any injuries at the receiver position, which is already thin. Um, he's got some familiarity with the players. You know, obviously it's a new coordinator, but some of the, a lot of the language is the same. Um, a lot of the players that he was here with, Josh, most importantly, and probably a guy that you can pretty easily slot in um, if something goes wrong. Maybe I'm completely reading this wrong, and, you know, he does get some run with this team. Um, but... My my initial thought is is he's just kind of there um, in case something does happen. Uh, and I also want to say for anybody out there that, you know, is really excited about the fact that OBJ is scheduled for a visit with the Bills and, you know, it's kind of narrowed down to four teams and more one of them. If, if you're one of the people out there that really wants to uh, have the team make a move for OBJ. Uh, I wouldn't be too bummed out and be like, oh, they sound, signed John Brown. Like, it's not happening now. Uh, I don't think that he's somebody that's going to, you know, really factor into into the top four. I think if the organization is interested in bringing in OBJ and he is still willing to come here, all that, I don't think adding John Brown stops you from still exploring that. Um so something that we'll just have to keep an eye on as, as that situation develops. Uh, but we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the defensive side of the ball, which is pretty much talking about injuries. Uh, so stick around. Hey, this is Bill Vader. Now back to the show. Welcome back in, and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fanbase Podcast Network. Uh, we're going to get back into it and talk a little bit about the defensive side of the ball here, and it's really hard to talk about the defense this year and not talk about injuries, and we've talked about it several times this isn't a show where we make excuses for what happened on the field, just kind of reasons, I guess. And it's another week where I can't help but to think of what this game would look like with a healthy roster. Um, already going into the game, dealing with some injuries. Um, obviously, we saw Trey White suit up today. That was great to see. Only got him back for 15 plays. Um, so... When he's back and playing full and feeling like himself, I think he's an absolute game changer on this defense. Um, but coming into this game not having him, 
Um, not having Micah Hyde the whole season. We have we go into the game down two defensive ends in um, Groot and Epinesa. We have Tremaine Edmonds out. You know, as much as he can be, you know, a, a kind of hot button uh, player for for this fan base. Um, there is a lot that he does in the passing game and routes that he takes away underneath. There's a lot of stuff that he does that you don't always see on camera. Um, yes, he has some frustrated missed tackles, uh, but that's still another one of your starters that's out. Even if he's not, you know, your your favorite starter, uh, he's another piece of the 111th that we don't have out there. Um, and then we have Benford suffer a, uh, I believe it was an oblique injury. Um, he moves to the IR and then the biggest one of all, and this is just tough to see, um, Von Miller goes down with a knee injury. Um, so obviously not ideal if you're ever talking about losing Von Miller on a defense, um, but just kind of compounded with the fact that you know, we already had injuries in Epinesa and Groot. Um, not only is it arguably your best defensive player, um, but at a position that was already getting thinned out, it just seems like all of our injuries on the defensive side of the ball are just like constant depth injuries. And, you know, we kind of got getting on track with getting the cornerback room healthy, and now it's the defensive ends. Um so I guess I will say the the good news, the benefit of recording this a few days after the game, um, but we did see that it was not an ACL injury for Von Miller. Um, the downside to that is uh, he's kind of taking, looks like seven to 10 days. Um, so he will miss uh, next week's game, um, but he's taking a little bit of time. They're letting the swelling go down. They want to get a couple... Um, second opinions and and see you know what the prognosis is if he's going to have surgery and you know probably miss the rest of the year or if it's something that he can kind of rehab and deal with um, to be able to finish out the season Um, so definitely like a a collective held breath in Bill's Mafia right as we um, see what happens with Von Miller definitely a dude that we could use come playoff time um but as far as the guys that were out there um mentioned at the top of the show this Detroit Lions team is is different than what we're used to um you know people aren't necessarily looking at them in a different light um, but this is a team that's really starting to come around especially on the offensive side of the ball um, some clever play calling, some good designs, um, kind of not asking Jared Goff to do too much. Um, a few running backs back there that aren't, you know, the flashiest guys, but are consistently, you know, falling forward, getting yards. Uh, Jamal, um, Jamal Williams leading the league in touchdowns. Um, so definitely some challenges in this game. And I thought overall, we did a pretty good job of keeping the run game in check. And I say pretty good because we, we still gave up a decent amount of yards on the ground. Um, and it seems to me like when we have these marquee running backs coming in, um, your Derrick Henrys, um, your Saquon Barkleys, we're able to hold them in check really well. Just looking at last week with Nick Chubb coming in, we hold them to something like 19 yards. Um, so not not egregious numbers given up on the ground, um, but it seems like when we're facing an opponent that kind of has this running back by committee, um, you know, we saw it with the Jets, we saw it in this game uh, a couple other times this year. It seems like for whatever reason, I don't know if we really key in on those marquee guys like Derrick Henry, uh, Nick Chubb, uh, but definitely seems like we, we give up more to the 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 less star powered guys i guess um dane jackson had another game where he struggled mightily and i'm i'm very glad that we're getting trey white back and healthy um 
Dane Jackson's going to see a ton of targets if he's, you know, st- still starting opposite of Trey White. And it, it kind of reminds me of of the Levi Wallace last year where, you know, he's getting picked on all the time because nobody wants to throw at Trey. Uh, but I, I just don't think the play is up to the same same level of what we were getting from Levi Wallace. Um, it seems like he's in position quite frequently and kind of just whether it's not getting his head around, not getting his hands in there, he, he's just getting picked on. And um, Kyer Elam has also been dealing with some injuries. Hopefully he can start, start fresh, get in there healthy and, and, maybe get some run across from Trey White. Um, I mean, it's great that Dane Jackson is where he's supposed to be and he's not getting flat out burned on routes. Um, I I need to see more at that position. And it's something that's, it's going, it's going to be a problem with some of these teams um, that are coming up. Some of these, you know, you look at a team like the Dolphins that have, you know, the two explosive receivers in, in Tyreek Hill and, uh, Jalen Waddle. It's really hard to you know pick the lesser of two evils there um, with players that talented and think you're going to come out on top. Um, so definitely something's got to give there, and I, I don't know if that answer is Kyer Elam. Um, I, it's it's not Benford now because he's moved to the IR. So um, we'll we'll see what happens there going forward. Um, Ed Oliver absolute monster of a game um i've been talking about him all year and and going back to last season it's he's the type of player that isn't really showing up on the on the stat sheet a ton um but the pressures the the amount of time he's spending in the backfield it's having an effect on games and this this past thursday um, he recorded his first full sack of the season, which just seems insane to think about with how disruptive that he, he's been. And obviously that sack he had was also a safety. Um, so great time for it to happen. Great way for it to happen. Hopefully we see more of this going forward. Um, but it seems like when when Von Miller went down, Ed Oliver kind of ratcheted up another gear and he's like, oh, okay, we, we need somebody to be that dude right now. I got you guys jump on my back. We're going. Uh, so it, it was great to see him rewarded in that way um, for the timing of the sack, the way it happened, all that, because I feel like he's been playing kind of lights out this year. And uh, I don't want to say it's going unnoticed, but like, because he's not getting, you know, four tackles for a loss and one sack per game. Um, it, he kind of slips through the cracks a little bit. Uh, last thing I'll say on him is get that man a damn turkey leg at, at the end of the game. I I know they had three people there that had great contributions to the game, but Ed Oliver deserved a turkey leg at the end of that one. That's all I'll say there. Uh, Daquan Jones, for me, continues to be an unsung hero of this team and um, similar to Ed Oliver, but in a very different way. Again, he's not a player that's going to be, you know, a stat stuffer. Um, But what he's doing with this defense, the way he's keeping the linebackers, helping keep the linebackers clean, um, letting, you know, the the other D tackles play off him. We see that with Ed Oliver. Um, We see it with Tim Settle. He also got pretty involved in this game. I think that's, you know, for so long we were looking for Star to be that guy. And there there was a lot of, you know, the conversation very similar to this of like, you know, he, he's not going to do a ton of stuff that's going to be flashy and put up numbers. You you just kind of got to watch the game and, and know that he's doing it and, and see him doing it. Um, this is a lot different than what we were getting out of Star Latulale. And I, I think that was you know, the piece that we were really looking for on this defense. Now, unfortunately, (laughs) we're missing a ton of pieces this year, so we can't really see it all completely come together. Um, But 
this defense healthy is is going to be absolutely terrifying. Um, hopefully, we get pretty close to that at some point this season. Uh, I'm not holding my breath because it, it seems like the football gods are just all over the Bills, and for the you know the last three four years of being one of the healthiest teams in the league, it, it's like all coming due or something. You know, it, it, it's not just that we keep having injuries; it keeps being to you know the stars of this team, um, the leaders, and Micah Hyde, Edmonds, Allen, uh, just just all over the place. Anyways, hopefully, hopefully we get the the health back there. Um, Love that Shaq Lawson is a depth defensive end for this team. Um, Again, not uh, another guy that's not the flashiest guy, but he's always in the right position. Um, He's great in the run game. Uh, He's able to generate some pressures. Um, Just for being, you know, at at the end of, of that defensive line depth, I think he's a really valuable piece to have there. And Lump Hoyer and Milano together, Milano didn't have the greatest game by his, by what his standards has uh, become. He had a couple, you know, pretty bad missed tackles, but still overall a great game. Um, But I'm here pounding the table again for a Jordan Poyer extension. I, He's so valuable to this team and what he does in in all phases of the defense, um, as a leader, as a player. Uh, he just does it all, and he does it really well. And I want to see him retire as a Bill man. I, I just extend him another two, three years. I I don't want to see him playing for another team. I don't want to have to line up and try to play against him. I uh, I I fully understand you know, some of the salary cap implications that we have going on. I know the money, you know, gets tight when you're paying Josh Allen money. Um, When you want to keep the band together, somebody's got to go at some point. You know, you you can't keep this team together forever. Um, There's only so much you can kick down the road and all that. All that being said, I don't want that to stop. I don't want Jordan Poyer to be the guy that, you know, kind of has to be a cap casualty. Um, do what you got to do. Figure it out. Brandon Bean, figure it out, man. We need Poyer on this team. I want to see Poyer and Hyde back playing together, healthy. Trey White, healthy. Kyer Elam, Dane Jackson, whoever it is, another year in the system. Daquan Jones filling up the middle. I just want to see it all come together. I want to see... More than anything I want to see out of this season, and you know, other than a Super Bowl. <laughs> um more than that, I, I just really want to see like the preferred starting eleven be able to play together healthy. And I, I feel like we haven't seen that all year. We started out without Trey White in there, obviously. So from day one you didn't have that. And just going forward, it's just been one injury after another after another. And Kudos to the Bills defense for getting it done. You know, it wasn't the prettiest game, but they did enough to to be able to come out of this game with, with a W um, against all of that adversity. Um, so valuable playing time for some of these depth pieces, but hopefully we can get to a point where they go back to um, being depth pieces. Um, So kind of looking forward for this team, we have a very tough stretch coming up and not only in um, the opponent, but the implications of each of these games. Um, We have New England coming up on Thursday um, in in Foxborough, and then we're back-to-back home games against the Jets and the Dolphins. And you know, Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott talk about it all the time of, you know, the the key to success is making sure you're winning your division. Um, well, where we're sitting in, sitting at right now, um, all the teams in this division have pretty comparable records. And uh, obviously the uh, Patriots end up losing on Thanksgiving night. Um, but recording this later on Sunday... Uh, the Dolphins and the Jets both won their games today. 
and uh, starting out in the division with a loss to both the Jets and the Dolphins kind of puts us behind the eight ball with with how this division is shaking out and how competitive it is. Um, that being said, you know the Bills can do an awful lot to help their chances of winning the division by taking care of business in these next three games. Um, but the same can be said for the other teams in the division. It's all right there in front of front of each of these teams. Um, you know, going into what week thirteen, any one of the teams in this division could win it. There's nobody at the bottom that's just kind of a punching bag. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can get a little bit of health going on. Um, come into these games as close to 100% as we can because this this is the stretch right here. These next three games kind of kind of make or break the season, um, at least as far as winning the division goes. Um, not even talking about, you know, looking at one seed in the AFC or anything like that. Um, just talking about getting to the playoffs and hopefully being atop this division. The, these next three games are absolutely enormous. Um, so obviously after those games happen, tune in. Uh, we'll, we'll be breaking down everything. Um, we drop every Monday. If you haven't done so already, do us a favor. It helps us out immensely. Um, like, share, subscribe. Click all the notification buttons. Make sure you don't miss any of the episode, episodes. I uh, appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, that's going to do it this week. I'm Justin from the Wandering Buffalo, and we'll see you next week. Go Bills.